Flat roofs or low sloped roof assemblies can be one of the most challenging building conditions to work with as the extremely shallow roof pitch means that water is going to stay on the roof for a longer period of time compared to a more steeply sloped roof. We also use a completely different range of materials to construct flat roofs compared to our standard roof assemblies, which can generate a lot of confusion and misapplication of materials and systems. Condensation is another common problem in flat roof systems, but the fact is that flat roofs or low sloped roofs are not going anywhere any time soon, and in fact, there's something that we encounter on a regular basis, especially in commercial buildings. We need to start getting these roof assemblies right to avoid these potential failures, and it all begins with how the roof is designed. In this video, we're going to share a flat roof remediation project that we consulted on, talk about how and why that flat roof failed, both from a design perspective and a construction standpoint, and then walk through some construction details of our solution and the overall remediation strategy that we'll be moving forward with. Whether you're a design professional, contractor, or builder, or even a homeowner, you're going to get something out of this. Without further ado, let's get into it. So this is a flat roof on a higher end single family home in climate zone 4A that was constructed actually quite recently within the last five or six years. A failure within five to six years is quite fast, even for a flat roof, and especially for failures like this, and it suggests that there is a little bit more going on apart from poor installation. This is an EPDM membrane. EPDM, or ethylene propylene diene monomer, is basically a synthetic rubber roof membrane. It's really common on the East Coast on low sloped roofs for single family homes. It's quite durable and it's relatively affordable. Roof membranes like this can actually last quite a long time, provided that they aren't stressed and unnecessarily challenged. We've seen some EPDM membranes last for 40 years before they have to be replaced, so it's not a bad roof membrane by any means. Now, the client, during their biannual roof inspection, noticed that the membrane started to blister and bubble around the perimeter of the parapet wall, and then observed a soft spot in the roof, along with a hole in the EPDM membrane. Now, this was observed during the summertime, and no water damage below had been reported yet, which likely meant that this was caught early enough, and it stresses the importance of these annual or biannual inspections if you do have a low-sloped roof. Whenever you see blistering or bubbling like this on a flat roof, it's usually an indication that we have moisture underneath the membrane that is evaporating when the sun hits the surface of that roof, since the gas wants to expand. This is normal to some degree, but when we have bubbles and blisters all over the membrane, there's usually a more serious issue at play, especially when we have an adhered membrane like this. Now, this moisture can come from several different sources. It can be from a bulk water leak from a poorly installed piece of flashing or seam tape. It could also be from air leakage into the roof system. Air has the ability to carry a lot of moisture, and if we don't have an air barrier separating the interior space below from the rest of the system above the structural decking, air leakage can deposit moisture into the upper parts of the assembly, and then it can get trapped beneath the impermeable roof membrane. All low sloped roof membranes are highly vapor impermeable, and in fact, they are almost perfect vapor barriers in most cases, so any moisture that migrates into the upper part of the assembly has virtually no chance of escaping. Excess construction moisture can also be the culprit of excessive blistering like this. It often rains during construction, and our building materials have a tendency to sequester water. If we seal up our roof before our components dry out, then of course we're going to have excess moisture trapped within our roof assembly, which could cause blistering. Now back to the roof. Take a look at this downspout and where it's discharging. The downspout for the upper floor roof is just dumping water directly onto the surface of the flat roof below, rather than extending that downspout to grade and to a stormwater leader or to a buried stormwater pipe. All of that water from the roof above is now concentrated at this one location and is challenging the roof membrane. Look where the deterioration is and where the blisters appeared. It's right underneath where that downspout terminates, which suggests that water was challenging this location, weakened the adhesives, and potentially migrated through the EPDM seam tape. The client also reported brown stains and drips around their exterior facade, around where they had parapets. When we observe stains like this, especially around parapet walls on the exterior facade, it's usually an indication that we don't have the proper drips in place to direct water away from the wall and to break surface tension. It also can mean that the coping, that's the metal or stone cap on top of parapet walls, could be sloped outwards to the exterior rather than inwards to the interior face of the parapet, or it could be a combination of both. Now, during deconstruction, we also noticed that there was a lack of counter flashing around the saddle flashing components and other corner transitions where the parapet wall meets a second floor wall assembly. Flashing the corners and intersections and really nailing those details 
is critical to the integrity of the roof system and its ability to effectively shed water whenever you have this type of intersecting building geometry. You'll notice that the metal flashing at this corner isn't counter flashed, which means that any water that drains onto the surface of that blue skin would actually be draining behind the metal flashing rather than over the metal flashing. Now, it might not be a lot of water, but it certainly adds up over time and can cause a lot of deterioration if it's ending up in some insulated cavity or void space that goes unnoticed. We were also able to get some photos of the roof while it was under construction, and you can see right here that the roof assembly was designed using a tapered sleeper system to provide the slight slope to the roof. Now there are several problems with the strategy. Some are construction problems and some are design problems, but look closely at this photo here. The builder started sheathing over the sleepers without any insulation installed above the roof decking, creating a void space between the structural deck and the substrate where the EPDM would be installed. This violates the International Residential Code when it comes to designing and constructing unvented roof assemblies, or what the code refers to as enclosed rafter assemblies. Additionally, the builder did not attempt to even ventilate the void space created by the sleeper system to create some form of moisture removal, albeit unreliable and still a code violation since there is no driving force apart from the wind to move moisture out of this space. There should have been exterior insulation filling this space to warm up the condensing surface of the first layer of sheathing. You'll also notice that there is no air barrier installed over the roof decking. We have to make sure that when we are designing an unvented roof system, that an air barrier is installed below the exterior insulation layer and over the decking to prevent warm, moisture-laden air from the interior from migrating up into the upper parts of the assembly and condensing on the underside of the roof covering, or in this case, the second layer of plywood. But were these all really just construction issues, or were these problems design issues? In reality, it was both. This is a detail from the original architectural set featuring the typical parapet wall and coping, and it also shows the buildup of the adjacent roof assembly. As you can see in these drawings, there was no exterior insulation installed above the roof deck for condensation control, and no closed cell spray foam applied to the underside of the roof deck. Just vapor open and air permeable bat insulation was specified between the rafter cavities. Now, the builder should have caught this, however, if it's not in the drawings and the builder is just constructing what is specified, then it's still a design issue at its core. The building department and inspectors also didn't catch this either, so in general there needs to be more education around the design of unvented roof assemblies and how to actually build them to avoid failures. They did call out a membrane to be installed beneath the parapet framing. However, this was not installed in the field, and it wouldn't have done much in the first place because the parapet and the roof deck are both uninsulated, so condensation can still form on the underside of that sheathing. It's also difficult to see how the EPDM membrane is terminated on the parapet wall. Is it terminated at the back of the parapet? Is it lapping over the parapet, like on this callout here? If so, why isn't it shown in the drawings? What is protecting the framed coping above? Overall, there is not enough information here for the roofer to successfully implement this design on top of all the other design-related issues. In the drawings, the framing forming the coping is also sloped to the exterior, which is why stains were observed on the exterior cladding. Remember, the coping should slope inwards towards the roof membrane, and the coping cap should have adequate drips to break surface tension and to direct water away from the wall. This is a design flaw, not a construction issue. This drawing also omits membrane flashing beneath the metal coping cap. If water leaks in through the seams, which of course it will, it's going to wet the framing below, and eventually that framed coping will rot out. Luckily, the builder had some sense and flashed the top of the framing prior to the installation of the metal coping, though it looks like they just used a strip of tar paper rather than an adhered membrane. Now, credit where credit is due, the architect did specify a cant strip to provide a more gentle transition from the horizontal surface of the roof to the vertical plane of the parapet wall. This reduces the thermal stresses on this 90 degree joint. However, it didn't make it into construction. The architect also didn't show how the slope of the roof would actually be achieved, whether that be on a sleeper system or with tapered insulation, or by sloping the rafters slightly away from the building. Either way, the builder considered that open to interpretation and moved forward with the sleeper system. Overall, the builder, the architect, and the building department were not well informed about how to design and construct these types of unvented roof assemblies, and there was not enough communication between the builder and the architect about how to address these missing pieces of information. 
too many assumptions were left up to the trades conducting the work, as the architectural drawings lacked sufficient detail, or were just flat out showing the wrong information. Now, we're not trying to shame the builder or the architect by bringing the stuff up, but we do want this to be an educational experience that we all can learn from. And if you're currently employing any of these building practices or designing your unvented low sloped roofs in this way, it might be time to take a step back and reassess what you've been doing. Again, we want you to succeed and we want to teach you how to design these assemblies properly so that you can eliminate your risk of future problems. So what are the solutions in this case? Well, we need to remove the existing roof membrane to reveal the extent of the damage, and then remove the sleepers and reframe the parapets so that we can get a continuous air barrier from the surface of the structural decking, that being the Advantech, down onto the surface of the WRB, which is Blueskin VP100. Then we can reframe the parapets, install exterior rigid insulation at the proper ratio for condensation control, along with tapered insulation to provide the slope to the scuppers, provide a gypsum cover board as the substrate for the new roof membrane that won't rot out like plywood if it gets damp, and install a new adhered roof membrane. In this case, we are opting for a TPO membrane instead of an EPDM membrane, as we like the fact that we can hot air weld those seams to provide a monolithic membrane. EPDM relies on the integrity of the adhesives in the seam tape, which can degrade over time. Or, if the installers aren't paying attention and there are fish mouths in the seam tape, that can result in a potential leak. Now, you'll notice that we are calling out a self-adhering TPO membrane rather than a traditionally adhered TPO membrane, and there is a big reason for this. The client and their family are extremely sensitive to chemicals, and if you know anything about adhesives for roof membranes, they generate a lot of fumes and are extremely volatile and can set off your respiratory issues very easily. They are also quite flammable as they contain flammable solvents as a delivery mechanism for the adhesive that can evaporate very quickly after it's applied to a substrate. Unfortunately, these fumy, solvent-based adhesives work exceptionally well. So why don't we just use the water-based adhesives? Well, if your water-based adhesive gets wet, it loses its integrity and turns back into slime, and then your membrane peels off like a sticker. And we're expecting a little bit of construction moisture to be trapped within this roof assembly. That's just how it is. We want to provide as much tolerance as possible for that, not to mention that if you do get a small leak in your roof, you don't want to have to replace your entire membrane and the substrate below. Additionally, water-based adhesives can take a very long time to dry compared to solvent-based adhesives, sometimes up to 48 hours, depending on the conditions in which you're installing it in. So the self-adhering TPO made the most sense for this application to avoid all of these various problems. We also made sure to slope that coping inwards to avoid staining the cladding, and provided proper drips to shed water away from the walls. Below the coping, we have also provided a flashing membrane that is adhered to the framing in the event that water leaks inside. If we were to draw a line from the surface of the roof up the parapet wall and up around the framed coping and down onto the exterior face of the wall, we would have one continuous and monolithic water control layer. That's the key to preventing leaks at these building transitions, among other things, but we do not want any discontinuities between our waterproofing materials. Speaking of transitions, I also want you to take a look at this termination bar. The termination bar is where the roof membrane terminates on an exterior wall and where it is mechanically fastened to prevent the membrane from peeling away from the wall if there was an adhesive failure or strong wind. That termination bar is set in a bead of mastic per the manufacturer's warranty detail. However, we go a step further and bridge the transition between the DENS deck and the termination bar holding the TPO membrane with a strip of highly aggressive pressure sensitive acrylic flashing tape that can bond to both materials. You'll see we called out some various products that could work in this application so that the contractor would have multiple options, but the point is that we want something that will be chemically compatible with the TPO, the aluminum term bar, and the glass mat facer on the DENS deck. Obviously, if you're using different membranes and materials, the tape that is specified will likely differ. Then, we counterflash the termination bar with a metal flashing, lapping the blue skin over it, to protect this critical transition from the damaging effects of heat, ultraviolet light, and of course, water. Installed over the roof sheathing, you'll notice that we have a peel and stick membrane, which is serving as the air barrier in the assembly. This is basically your standard ice and water shield product, and that membrane laps over the existing blue skin on the exterior wall. I recommend taping that joint as well due to the poor adhesion between the rubberized asphalt membrane and the surface of the blue skin. However, if you are lapping an additional layer of blue skin over that ice and water shield, it's probably not necessary unless you want some additional redundancy. So that's the parapet detail that has been corrected and modified in a way that prevents condensation and promotes a much more watertight assembly. 
Now, I just want to point out that we still need to avoid those huge concentrations of bulk water on the roof, and so the downspout that was draining onto the surface of the flat roof is to be relocated so that it discharges to grade and away from the building. Now, let's take a look at this roof to second floor wall transition. Unlike the parapet, our roof membrane is terminating on an exterior wall in which the opposite side of the wall is conditioned space. Now, believe it or not, that does change how we approach this detail. First of all, if we just lapped that roof membrane up the exterior wall in this climate, we could potentially see condensation form on the back side of the sheathing, and it would have no ability to dry out because the roof membrane is vapor impermeable, and in fact, we have observed very distinct mold and moisture patterns like this if the sheathing can't dry. We have moisture from the interior diffusing out of the building during the cooler months as moisture moves from high concentrations to low concentrations, and from the warm side of the wall to the cold side. In order to counteract this, we've extended the poly -iso insulation up the wall to the level of the roof membrane termination to warm up the condensing surface of the sheathing. If we can't dry through the sheathing to the exterior, the least that we can do is keep it warm, so it has less of a chance of forming condensation in the first place. Now over the roof membrane termination and the edge of the poly iso, we are taping that joint with our pressure sensitive acrylic flashing tape, the same stuff that we used on the parapet to protect this transition and to get our water and air barrier continuity from the surface of the WRB down onto the roof membrane. Then we counter flash with our metal flashing and then we tape the metal flashing to the existing blue skin that's adhered to the sheathing with more pressure sensitive acrylic flashing tape or if you wanted a liquid applied flashing, both will provide a monolithic transition even with a reverse lap. Then we're set up to reclad the building with the siding of choice. Now I quickly want to touch on our scupper detail. Uh, we're not going to do a deep dive into this, but there is one feature that no one else is doing and it drives us crazy. A lot of EPDM, TPO, and PVC membrane manufacturers call for a reverse lapped flashing detail because it's easier to install the scupper. This is probably the one location where you really don't want a reverse lap since this is the one location that sees the most amount of water, but we see this detail all the time. And guess what? Scuppers always leak. We take the same approach to scuppers as we do with window sills. We design a pan flashing for the scupper so that when it inevitably leaks, it will fail in a safe manner, be discharged to the exterior rather than leaking inside the roof assembly. Guys, if you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.